And we have a new acting IGP tonight. Tonight we're going to get into some specifics about who he is, but most importantly, how important is this appointment for this time and for the police service? And the police service is, uh, of course, is, has, has a very tenuous, strained relationship with the citizens. Uh, its reputation has been, been battered and criticized. Um, is this an appointment that changes all that? Is this the game changer uh, when it comes to the uh, police administration? We'll get into that shortly. And who we see? I'm pretty sure you know by now. His name is Dr. George Akufo Dampari. And he is the incoming IGP. He's going to be acting for a while because the president had asked his uh, the incumbent, um, Siopio Pombuero, to proceed on terminal leave, which means that he's going to go on leave and not return. In his place, um, Dr. Dampari is taking over. We know that he's the youngest, and from what this is what we know so far, he's the youngest acting IGP uh, to be appointed. Uh, in the Fourth Republic. He's also the eighth youngest since Ghana gained independence. And so this is a big deal. Uh, young, fresh blood, enthusiastic, is uh, pretty modern too in his, in his thinking about policing. And so great, great uh, appointment by all standards if you listen to what the experts uh, are talking about on this. We also know he joined the Ghana Police Service as a, as a constable in 1990. So this is clearly someone who's risen through the ranks. He's done it and seen it all. Um, he's paid his due indeed um, to, the, to the service, right? He, he rose through the ranks um, to become commissioner of police. Uh, 24 years later, a rank he held uh, until his appointment. So that is clearly something that, you know, it's, uh, is unique about him. If you look at the last uh, few IGPs we've had, age is on his side. If we, and, but the thing that we need to also look at is the fact that it's, it's an acting position. And often we have acting IGPs. It's been a while since we had substantive ones. That throws up its own complications, right? We'll get into what that means um, for his job very shortly and how quickly should his, uh, his, his appointment become more permanent. Um, so he become the substantive IGP, not an acting one, and, and, and what that means uh, for him. We'll talk about that very shortly. Well, Director General for Administration and Director General for Welfare, he's held these positions before. But for welfare in particular, at a time when the morale, we are told, the police service, is, uh, it's not at its highest, um, the, many who say that background is key because of what he did when he was at welfare. He, he, the the stunned fight he put up to protect his men and women on the front lines. Um, you know, those who were not well, he visited them. He made sure that he mobilized resources to take care of them. He fought for their land and their properties uh, to be given to them. He's a director general also of MTTD. So he's been everywhere. Uh, Motor Trans uh, Transport and Transport Department, uh, also been at research and planning. Uh, he's been all over the place, the director of general for operations, right? So he's been at the helm of uh, police operations, so he knows what it takes to be boots on the ground. Uh, ICT, yeah, he's been there as a boss. Uh, finance too, there as the boss. Um, National Patrol Department, again, again, doing the job on the front line. He himself uh, has been on the front line doing the business, arresting individuals, putting himself in the line of fire uh, and harm. Um, so this is not going to, by any stretch of the imagination, going to be an armchair IGP. He's a man who really hands on um, from, from the track record and from his profile and what he's done in the past. And what, what do we know? What are some of the key things he's done that we know of? As the DG in charge of welfare, he introduced the uh, social welfare scheme and strategic medical interventions for police officers, which is absolutely key. This is somebody who will endear himself to the rank and file, to the uh, those on the front line because, of course, he stood for them before. He can, he can refer to that uh, as a basis of galvanizing and improving morale uh, in the service. In 2013, he led a team of officers to restructure the Armored Car Squadron uh, unit into what we now know as a form police unit. And this is a major, major deal uh, for the Ghana Police Service and within a record time of uh, 10 weeks. So this is somebody who also knows how to do things but do it quickly. Uh, and, and effectively and efficiently, right? Previously, he worked as a research fellow and a lecturer at the King's College London, University of, of, of London. Now, so again, 
we are just not having somebody who is um, a, a trained police officer. He's an academic, right? And the beauty of his appointment is that he's not only theory, he's a lot of practice too. Uh, he's done it. He's done policing on the ground as a constable and is boxing it with also his theory. And so this is an all-rounder when it comes to the job. Uh, he lectured at the UCC, Gimpa Regent University College and the Data Link University College. And so that, that's, that's where his, his economic background comes. He's one of the pioneer lecturers at the business school of KNUSD. It's, it's one of those appointments for the right time. We'll get into that very shortly. Why the timing of this is so critical? Now, I judge the overall best recruit at the National Police Training School. Uh, and so again, it comes back to his performance, not only on the job, but even in qualifying to become a police officer, one of our all best cadet. Um, so again, it tells you the kind of person that, that uh, Dr. Dan Parry is. And, and tonight I want to be um, speaking to a few of the people who know him. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Professor Kwisieni, um, who knows him very well. He's joining us uh, for this conversation. Uh, we also have uh, joining us tonight for the conversation, uh, Adam Bonar, who also, of course, I, I was, I'm on a platform with him in, in which uh, he had, had said earlier that we can anticipate this. He joins us on, the, on, on Zoom as well. I'm talking about uh, a security analyst, uh, a CEO of the Security Warehouse Limited, Adam Bonar also is joining us. Uh, and I am, I'm delighted that we'll also be joined by a, a, a police officer who, of course, is the Deputy Chair of uh, the Defence and Interior Committee in Parliament. Now, I'm, I'm, I am delighted that he, she's joining us, Madame Ophelia Hayford, because until she became a member of Parliament, she was also a senior police officer. And, and that you know, background is interesting to tap into, especially when you have a, such an important uh, appointment and she's joining us on phone. We'll come to her very shortly. But let me start with you, Professor Aiding. On, on, on this appointment, uh, and, and you, uh, you were with me on Top Story, and you, this is an appointment that you believe is right for the time, correct? It's right for the time, he's prepared, he's thought through what he will do as an IG, he's trained people at multiple levels, he's held different appointments, and he's got a guts to deal with anyone who crosses the line. That's what I like about him. For him, this is not a cushy job where he's going to be polite and friendly to people because they gave him a job. I think those who gave him this job know that the service is rotting to the core and that they want an IGP who, as a commissioner of police, on the Spintex Road, when there's traffic, when people misuse their sirens, he pulled them over and told them to get back into the queue. Okay, he did these things when it could have risked the possibility of his promotion. So this is an officer who knows that the institutional ethos and the culture of the police service goes against the very grain of his upbringing, of his academic training, and the vision that he has for the service, and has throughout his professional career worked hard to ensure that he could marry a sense of professionalism with a duty of care, but more importantly also, with front, taking the decisions, the operational decisions when necessary, but also being on the front line with his men and women mm. so that he doesn't take those decisions, sits in the office or, or goes to sleep and then expects to receive a report the next morning. He has a hands-on approach to doing policing and I'm looking forward to our partnership and our collaboration. And I think he has broad shoulders enough to accept the criticisms that certainly will come from Adam and I. I can already see from his face that he's looking forward to put forth some criticisms very soon. 
But I mean, I'm really very optimistic about this. I, I have a lot of things to say about the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Interior that over 20 years has filled the people of Ghana in performing their responsibilities in requesting the police council to provide reports to the So I'm asking the deputy chair who is here and serve as a former police officer. Please let's work together to make this appointment a success. It rubs off well on the committee in parliament. It keeps the IG in check. It keeps uh, him up in check and ensures that the leadership of the Ghana Police Service would deliver that grand vision of being a 21st century policing organization. Mm. Right now, it looks more like a 16th century police organization, capable, unwilling, and unequipped to deliver the protection of the people of Ghana. I mean, Mr. Bonar, it was you who predicted this. Um, I, I, I'm on a platform with you where you you gave a hint that this was going to happen. Um, was it was it more than 24 hours ago that you made this prediction? Um, what did you know then that we didn't know? Okay, so good evening uh, to my brother, uh, Prof. Uh, and uh, uh, Well, I, I, I was expecting this to happen by the 1st of July. Uh, this month, uh, per, you know, uh, that went on. I'm aware this was supposed to have happened around the 1st of July, but uh, you and I know, and I believe my brother, uh, Prof. Enin also knows, uh, before the 1st of July, uh, you know, we had a certain ejera that overran this country, and we had a certain war that overran this country. And so it wouldn't have been prudent to make this announcement. So there was a need to, you know, push it to the first, uh, to have a proper handing over and a confirmation uh, of a substantive IGP by the 1st of August. And so I think this, this is better late than never. Uh, Prof. Enin, I will start from uh, where my brother Enin mentioned the police service is rotten to the core. It is perfectly true. The Ghana Police Service at the moment, uh, it's nothing to write home about. Some of us have been talking about it and uh, we have expectations. And I do believe that as, uh, I mean, and uh, just like Prof. Enin said, I know Dampari, Dr. Kufu Dampari very well. And I am going to hold on, give him all the benefits of the doubt Believing that the politicians would not, you know, bastardize his administration, they would allow him to do his work. But I do want to see him be very assertive and ensure that, uh, you know, the politicians will stay away from him and he's going to do his work and ensure that the rank and file as an IGP. One thing some of us within the space know is that he would have to go along with all his men, and he needs to build bridges. But the current police administration that he has inherited is nothing to write home about, and I am hoping that he's going to build solid bridges and bring all the stakeholders to a round table to ensure that uh, this country becomes, uh, you know, the place that we've all been uh, craving Mr. for. Mr. Bonner, you talk about building bridges, but knowing a little of him, He's very affable, he comes across. He knows how to build these bridges and reach out. I mean, I, I met him in 2007 in the north with former President Kufo on a tour of, of flood. And you like him, I liked him instantly when I met him. There's something, and all my colleagues who have met him come, come across with the same impression of somebody who is down to earth, humble, very accessible, charming, and able to get you to understand his point of view. Is this something that will come in handy, especially for a police service, as both of you have agreed, it's, uh, it's, it has a big, big challenge? Well, yes. It is the reason why I have I keep reiterating the fact that uh, where we are, it looks like the bridges have all been destroyed. It are bombed or maybe some earthquake 
uh, you know, took them down. And so some of us are expecting him. It's going to be a very tough, tough job for him to do, reconstructing all those bridges and ensuring that the men and women in boats are going to do what is expected, get across to him and relay information to him, and he getting across to the other side of the bridge and getting uh, relaying information to them and ensuring that at the end of the day, the police service that seems to be mimicking the military. I mean, some of us, I believe my uh, profaning has said this rally. I have raised it. Other colleagues have raised this. We don't need a police service that seems to be mimicking the military. The military has its own function. You know, they have a duty to perform. The police has a duty to perform. But unfortunately, you saw in, uh, I think, one college in Kumasi where we were told Operation Calm Life went in, I suppose, with the military. You saw a draft. And so some of us want a situation where police will perform policing duties and the military will perform military duties until such a time. There are some operations that you know the military would come in to perform, like, you know, uh, some of the, opera, you know, the conquest fists and other things. But issues to do with chasing the criminals here and there, you don't need the military. And so I want to see an IGP who would remind the policymakers that, you know what, we are here to protect you. You don't need to call the military. Let's call the military when it is necessary, but allow us to perform our duty. I think we haven't seen that for a while, and I am craving to see a police service that is beginning to assert itself and beginning to believe in itself. But at the moment, uh, I will tell you that some of us, some people thought that uh, we were maybe taking on the former IGP too much. But I mean, he's a friend. If you ask a former bueno, I mean, he's a very good friend. But the truth is that when the thing is not good and those who are closer to you cannot tell you, then who else? Mm. Mind is that just as Prof. Enning said, we are going to continue to judge all with them. We will continue to, you know, pat them in the back and say, if you are not doing what, we'll call you into the room and tell you, Jack, do it this way, do it this way. If you don't do it that way, then you will see some of us speak publicly. And so I believe that uh, in Prof. Enning yeah, uh, we're, we're losing you there. But I want to bring Prof. Enning on something that you said, very critical. Prof, we see this country work better. And, and I'll bring um, Madam, Madam Hayford in shortly on the back of this. Because there's something that he said that has been at the bane of the police administration for a while. is a political uh, link that has always been established. And whether or not a fine gentleman that Dr. Dampari is, um, he can stand up and be assertive as... Um, you know, Adam Bonar has suggested in the face of what we know often tends to be politicians not wanting the police to simply do their professional job. Isn't that going to be one of the biggest challenges you have to face and deal with? Prof. No, I think this is a personal decision that shows the metal of the individual who is occupying this office. And I believe Dr. Dan Parry has that, that metal. He has the integrity. And for him, this is not just a job. This is a mission. In all the 15 years or so, I've known Dr. Dan Parry, and I knew him first when Inspector General of Police, Paul Quay, sent me on a mission to identify structures in the Western region uh, to establish the Marine Police. And I did the consultancy and then brought it to him. And that was when I first met Dr. Dampari. Transforming the Ghana Police Service and making it into a genuinely world-class institution that responds to the needs of societies and citizens. For Dr. Dampari, it's a mission. And the dream of, or the process to achieving that mission is what Evans, you've listed, that in every position he has got, he's tried to leave a legacy, a legacy that represents the professionalism, his own professional ethos, his integrity, his empathy. And the bottom line is that nobody pushes him around. Mm. And I think the level of rottenness in the service contributed to those who made this choice. That who can we bring on board 
to, to bring about a change, a fundamental uprooting of the institutional rottenness that we are seeing. And much as Dr. Dan Parry is not a pushover, and that some of the things he will do will affect those who matter or think they matter, a rational choice has been made. We need the police service, but we need it to be led by somebody who has broad shoulders, who has the intellectual vision and sagacity, but a hands-on operational set of experiences who, as my brother Adam is saying, is willing to build bridges first within his own organization. Let's not forget that this culture of, of appointing you know, people who have retired, mm -hmm. that gives politicians a leeway yeah. to play them like a marionette. Yeah. Okay, this time around there, there was a rational decision to say, look, this is a man who is nowhere near retirement age. He has the track record. We realize we may not be able to push him around, but that rational choice also tells us that he's the man who can bring the police back to where it needs to be. So we are going to put our personal interest in manipulating the police service and previous IGPs aside, mm. and to say, look, we are willing to get an IGP who has the gravitas, the panache, the knowledge, and the drive to leave a police service so that when he himself goes on retirement, he feels safe to walk around with his children, his arms around Madame's shoulders, and hopefully when he gets grandchildren, he and his grandchildren can go out safe. That is the job that we are giving, Adam and I are giving to Dr. Dan, Dan Parry. Build a service that you are proud of, that when you don't have police bodyguards, you can walk in town secure, safe in the knowledge that you have done your best and you have built structures and processes that has strengthened that institution. That is the IGP that we are looking for. Fantastic. And that is the fix that we have. Fantastic. I want to bring in um, Madam, um, Madam uh, Ophelia Hayford, uh, who of course is joining us on, on the phone tonight. Uh, Madam Hayford, if you're with me, um, you, obviously, before, in your previous life, just a few short months ago, you were a serving police officer. Have you, have you, were you, have you been in contact with Dr. Dampari uh, since his appointment and before you became a politician? How have you, have you known him and what, what do you know of him? Thank you. And uh, let me take this opportunity to say good evening to your cherished viewers and to comment on the president for appointing Dr. Dan Parry as the next Inspector General of Police. I also take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Dan Parry on his appointment. Actually, if you asked me if I had known him, I would say yes. Apart from he being my officer then, we had a personal relationship. He was a good friend. He was somebody you can just walk to and then seek advice or counsel. I can say he really advised me when I wanted to resign and take up the position as uh, the candidate for the new patriotic party for advancement. When he saw my resignation, he personally called me on my phone and asked several questions why I wanted to resign and take up that position. He tried to inquire whether I was being pushed around by some politicians to take that decision. But after listening to all that I wanted to do, wanted to continue with the good job of my husband, and his passionate desire to leave a legacy in Phantom, he said, he wishes me well and that they will support me. So if you ask, I know Dr. Dumper very well. He holds a good reputation. He's affable. He's loved by the rank and file within the police service. He's a visionary leader who encourages and then motivates the youth to aspire higher within the service. Hmm. 
I mean, that, that testimony there is a powerful one. And coming from an insider, um, he says something that you said I want to reiterate. He says he's loved by the rank and file of the police service. And uh, the line wasn't great. We're going to take a quick break and return and see if we can correct that so that we can hear that. Because it's something that powerful that Madame uh, Hayford talks about, that when she was about to resign um, from the police service to become a politician, it was Dampari who called her and, and, and advised her and sought to understand, are you taking the decision because politicians are putting pressure on you? And she said to him, no, I, I simply want to continue the good work that my husband was doing. He understood what she was, she was coming from, but she, he was, he was, in, he was clear in reaching out um, when a, a colleague of, of his was making such a very important decision. And no wonder you hear her testify the love that he has among the rank and file. Uh, when, I, when I return from the break, I will we'll delve into whether that, that quality that he has. At a time when the police service has a strained relationship with the public, um, is he the right man for the time in terms of his ability to you know, get the police to build that relationship with the citizens, first of all? But what about the acting position that he's been put in? Um, should that tag go off and what would it take and how soon should that happen? But also, what does it say about the president who appointed him um, in, in terms of the decision that had been made? You want to stay with me because we we'll look at all these angles and then we'll go to parliament. Professor Enning has made a point that the Committee on Defense and Interior must assist for this appointment to work. What is it that the committee is prepared to do working with him to get this appointment working for the police to be transformed. At the time when we have a new national security strategy, a huge part of that is reforming the police service. A lot to get into. Stay with me after this break. Thank you for staying with us here on PM Express. Of course, uh, we are discussing the uh, appointment tonight of COP Jordan Paris as the acting IGP. My guests, uh, Professor Chris Yening, um, Mr. Adam Bonar, and of course, the deputy uh, chairman, chairperson of the Defense and Interior Committee, Madame Ophelia Hayford. Madame Hayford, uh, before the break, you were telling us why you believe this appointment is the right appointment for the time because of the love that he has among the rank and file the police of the police service. Uh, but he's coming at a time, would you agree, as a Defense and Interior uh, Committee, when the police itself has come under the, the, the stress and the relationship is strained with the public. Idra um, is an example of that. What, how, how does he go about fixing that particular uh, challenge? And, and also within the police service, boosting morale. Yeah. I think Mr. Dampari has come at the right time, at a time when the trust for the police have gone down. This is a man who has diverse knowledge and a diverse portfolios within the police. He had worked as an administrator, as an auditor, he's been with the investigation department. And so he knows all the issues. He's been an operations commander before. And during his tenure, we saw a lot of changes within the police service. So he coming as the inspector general of police. I am positive, and I know that he's going to change a lot of things. And we are going to see a new policeman uh, with the new vision of transforming the police service into a world class capable of delivering a planned, democratic, protective, and peaceful service, Dan Parry will be able to up his game and we will see a different policy within the country. But, but for him to succeed, I mean, your committee will have to play a very important role. Professor Enning is on record to have talked about um, the work that the committee must do to make sure that this appointment works. I mean, do you appreciate how significant your role will be 
in helping Dr. Dampari achieve the, um, I guess, the expectations of, 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 of that you have of him that you've just expressed? Sure, I'm positive. Before his appointment, we have even met with the outgoing Inspector General of Police, trying to put things right for us to get the police service we wanted. Some of the proposals we made was that the IGP should channel some of their resources into robusting the SPU, so that before the military is called in, the SPU will be there to hold the fort in combating any riot or any chaos before the military are called in. So we, the committee, we, the members committee in parliament, we were in consultation with the stakeholders to get the police service we all wanted to see before his appointment. And knowing Dan Parry as the man he is, who has been an operations commander and during his tenure was just um, harm life and all these operations instituted. And he took active part. And we saw that crime wave within the country went down. He himself would be there on the ground with the men to conduct the operation. So knowing Dan Parry very well and with our support, I know he's going to deliver. In the interim, he's an acting IGP. Would you would you like for him to be confirmed as a substantive IGP as quickly as possible? I'll be grateful, more than grateful, if he is confirmed, which I know for sure that the government would definitely confirm him, considering uh, the way he will work. I mean, Mr. Bonner, let me bring you on that question. Um, he is acting. Uh, does that pose a challenge to his ability to do this job with, without fear and favor, effectively and efficiently, without looking on the shoulders? Well, I, I think uh, Evans, uh, it's a process. You know, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's been a convention, and I believe that there is a constitutional, uh, what do you call a requirement by the president uh, to get someone uh, appointed, and you definitely, the president would have done consult. I know a lot of backroom consultation went on. Uh, now it's public notice that he's been, you know, uh, appointed in acting position. Obviously, he would have to uh, accept the, uh, we have only seen uh, the president appointing him, he would have to accept. And once that is done, the president would have to go to, uh, you know, the president would have to get him properly confirmed through, you know, a recommendation from, uh, you know, in consultation with the Council of State. And so I do believe that it's a constitutional requirement the leadership of this country would have to follow. And I have no doubt in my mind that uh, he's going to be confirmed as soon as possible. I think the current, uh, the outgoing IG uh, is proceeded on leave. I think is technically leaving the scene by the 1st of uh, August which is just around the corner. And so I'm sure that the president uh, faced with all the security challenges we are faced with is going to ensure that uh, uh, Kufu Dampari, my brother Kufu Dampari, uh, is, is uh, confirmed. So that at the end of the day, uh, you know, and let's also pat the leadership of this country in the back. The president has broken protocol for a very long time. He's been tired and retired police officers who are appointed to be IGPs. Uh, at the expense of young, exuberant, you know, young officers, experienced officers. And so I think now the, you know, the baton has been handed to uh, some of the very young ones to superintend over the police. And I want to see, uh, you know, a remarkable change. For instance, uh, Madame spoke about the FUP, I mean, the, the police form uh, unit. It shouldn't be a unit that is put together just for peacekeeping. Let's have the whole of this country uh, you know, uh, this uh, unit extended to the whole of this country, not a, a unit that is just established for peacekeeping. But at the moment, that is the way it looks. And I do believe that uh, Dampari it's going to ensure that this is done so that the military doesn't become the point, the first point of call when there is, uh, you know, picketing or civilians, uh, you know, agitating uh, about something, Evans. I mean, Professor Inning, so the, what, what, what does his appointment also say about the, 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 the political class that made the decision? 
Um, did they read the mood right? And, and I ask that also because we were just a few weeks back discussing the new um, national security strategy document, which has a significant part for the police service. Um, weeks on, we have a new police IGP uh, who I guess believe must operate within that strategy and implement its, its, its tenets. Do you see a certain trend there in terms of the, the, the politicians in charge of our national security architecture appreciating the need to reform this entire system and making strategic moves, one with the strategy, now with the appointment, uh, uh, to achieve a certain end of reforming the entire structure? Professor Aini, what, what, what's, what's your take on that? Is there a certain trend you're observing in terms of an acknowledgement that something needs to happen with the current structure that we have for the national security? Uh, Prof, can you unmute for me? I understand you, you're possibly still on mute. No, Ibas, there is no time. We've fiddled and we've danced whilst things have gotten very bad. The politicians who made this decision had a choice between the rock and the hard place. And let me give you just about two or three examples of dramatic failure in police intelligence, but even more disturbingly in how the national security apparatus itself has behaved. One was the blowing off of the head of the police officer who was in the bullion van. <clears throat> two disgraceful responses came out of it. Within a few days, 225 people had been arrested. And we wondered, Adam and I, whether all those people were related to that one criminal who were just picked up. Now, all the 225 were released. And as of now, we don't know the status of that investigation. That's number one. Number two, there was someone who had his own private CCTV camera. The police service came and told us, oh, Evans has private CCTV cameras that may have captured the criminals, and he doesn't want to release it. Placing an independent individual who seeks to protect himself, his business, and his family directly in harm's way. No decent police organization does that. We saw in a the, manip the manipulative falsehoods from the police and the inability both of the National Intelligence Bureau official in Edra and the police officers to capture the mood of the youth, okay? Allowing a fairly painful situation to degenerate into what we have seen. Now, when you have your frontline and law enforcement agencies failing so catastrophically in responding to fairly straightforward things, then you know you are in trouble. And therefore, you remember, Ivan, you and I had this conversation. When Azugu and his boys also misbehaved at Ayawaso with the CTFM guy in Asan Kregwa, it made mincemeat of the rhetoric inside the National Security Strategy document of building a secure and prosperous Ghana with regional and global reach and influence. You don't get global reach and influence if the human rights of your own citizens are flouted so flagrantly as Azugu and his boys used to do. Now, Andrea and Wa also demonstrated to us institutional challenges that once more, and even more disturbingly, that these institutional challenges led to institutional cultures in which human rights and the rule of law were being threatened by the people and joined by the state to protect the state and its citizens. So a Kufudan Paris appointment is a desperate but a proper intervention to pull back from the brink in terms of institutional rights. Now, 
the national security strategy brings into focus almost everything that is a threat. And therefore, there's a fuzziness to it. But my interest in that strategy document relates to the institutional mechanisms and the coordination role, first, of the National Security Council itself, but more importantly, of the new ethos for coordination, for efficiency, for effective decision making, and for developing an institutional system and an, and, and an institutional structure that requires rapid, coordinated, and comprehensive responses. Now, for those of my enemies who are out there who think I am making up these words, these are direct quotes from the National Security Strategy. Now, the coordination becomes the key. So for me, there are four things that the National Security Strategy document must seek to do. And I'm, and I'm highlighting these four things because if you see the catastrophic failures I am talking about, and the fact that the document was ready as far back as late 2019, what it means is that the principles and the values and the norms inherent in the strategy document have not been imbibed by those who need to implement it. Otherwise, Azugu would not have happened, Asankagwa would not have happened, Adria would not have happened, Wa would not have happened, and we wouldn't have had a police officer telling us that a sound he heard sounded like a pump action gun. Now, that was a lie. Now, so the four things that I think we need to highlight on in terms of the national security strategy is the strategy document's own words about effective decision making, about developing institutional systems, about integrated coordination and the new institutional culture and ethos. That is what we should be fighting for. And I think Adam and I, when the strategy document was released, were optimistic about it, that this is a work in progress. And I think a Kufudan Pare becomes a critical fulcrum around which these flowery, you know, uh, flourishes, rhetorical flourishes can be transformed and translated into institutional uh, reality. Um, I want to take another quick break. When I return, I would, I would give, I will get my guests' assessment on what they believe will be uh, COP Dr. Dampari's biggest challenge going into this job. What, what should be, what, sh what should his priorities be um, as he's taking over? What is the number one thing that he must get right um, as as he takes his job? As we've elaborated. There's no doubt that he's the right man for the job. And so what is it that he must make his single most important priority? Uh, if you want to get to know what the experts think of this, stay with me after the break. My guest, Professor Aining, um, uh, Mr. Adam Bonar, and uh, Madame of, of Ophelia uh, Hayford. Um, Madame Hayford, to you, uh, I come to next. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Dampari is going into this job. I wonder, uh, from where you sit and your previous experience, what, what do you think sh his biggest priority should be um, now that he's taking over in the acting position? Thank you. I think uh, his biggest priority will be to transform the service by restructuring and putting things right, especially with the MTTD and with us advocating for the revamping of the FPU to enable them to take up some of the demonstrations and the routes in the country, for the military not to be the first point of call when it comes to issues of uh, demonstrations and the riots. Mm. Um, Mr. Bonner, what about you? What, 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 what would you say his uh, topest, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his topmost priority should be, briefly? Uh, 
I, I think I'll take it from where Madame left off. Uh, it should be to restructure the Ghana Police Service. At the moment, you can see the it, it just exists, but there's no structure. So he needs to look at it and ensure that the right persons are put in positions where they can perform. But at the moment, it looks like you have persons in various positions who have no clue uh, of what they are supposed to be doing. I, I am expecting to see him once it's confirmed. Once it's confirmed, I want to see a lot of movement and restructuring and ensuring that police officers in this country, uh, probably the lost glory, they get it back. Uh, you know, it's gone. So some of us want to see our police officers once again being police officers and, you know, uh, and performing police duties. Mm. Uh, uh, Professor Aini? Well, very briefly, three quick points. First, um, both speakers have spoken about right persons restructuring. Bring back experienced commissioners of police. Christian Tetoyohunu, Kofi Bwache, Dr. Gareba. Two, reinstate you know, a regulation 38 of CI 76. Too many police officers have spent too long in their present positions in present positions in towns, districts. They have become just a part of the furniture in those towns. Move them out. Third, please try and bring back some form of motivation, personal motivation. Let's now give them some form of contract. That says we can assess their performance from IGP to the constable on the beat. Simple, straightforward, effective answer. Gentlemen and ladies, I'm grateful. And we wish uh, Dr. Dampari all the best uh, in, this, in this new endeavor. Um, there's no doubt that he has the support of many. And of course, uh, we can only wish him all the best. He comes with a lot of advantages. Uh, we obviously, uh, I, I don't see any reason why I can't give him my own support. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.